Okay, so welcome to Interference of Waves from Two Sources. This is the fourth video of Unit 8, Mechanical Waves and Sound. So make sure you've got your notebook out and you're ready to take notes. And again, I, as always, I encourage you to pause and rewind the video as much as possible. Rewatch it as many times as you need. Now, perhaps you have seen or even have a pair of headphones such as these that offer active noise reduction. When you turn these headphones on, they produce sound that somehow cancels the noise from the external environment. So the question is, how does adding sound to a system make it quieter? This is one of the questions that we're going to answer in this video in which we look at the interference of waves from two sources. Now, we began this unit by talking about how waves, unlike particles, can pass through each other. And where they do, the principle of superposition tells us that the displacement of the medium is the sum of the displacements due to each wave acting alone. Suppose we have two speakers. Both of them are emitting the same frequency. Now here, the sound coming from speaker two passes speaker one. Then the two overlapped sounds uh, continue on from speaker one uh, to this point here. So the question is, what sound is heard at this point. Or suppose we place the two speakers uh, this way and what's the sound at this point? These are two cases that we're going to consider in this video and although we're going to use sound waves for our discussion here, the results are, are really general and apply to all waves. So here is a picture that shows two loudspeakers sending traveling waves along a line. These graphs in the picture are slightly separated only to show you uh, what, what is happening. The physical situation though is, is one in where the waves are traveling on top of each other. So we're going to assume that the two speakers emit the same sound waves of identical frequency, wavelength, and amplitude. At every point along this line, and the net sound pressure wave will be the sum of the pressures from the individual waves. That's the principle of superposition. Because the two speakers are separated by a wavelength, the two waves are aligned crest to crest and trough to trough. When waves are aligned this way, they're said to be in phase. Waves that are in phase, kind of you can think of them as kind of like marching along in step with each other. If we add the two waves point by point, we're going to see that their superposition is a traveling wave with a certain wavelength and twice the amplitude of the individual waves. And what we'll get here is constructive interference. So in our picture, D1 and D2 are the distances from each speaker to the point that we're interested in. We want to know what's the sound at this point. Their difference in length is called the path length difference. It's the extra distance that's traveled by wave two uh, on the way to that point where the two sound waves are combined. Now we see from this picture that constructive interference will result at that point uh, when the path length it, difference is equal to a wavelength. But if we increase that path length difference by an additional wavelength, would produce exactly the same result. We would get constructive interference. And if we tripled the distance between them, we'd get the same result, constructive interference at that point. The point here is two waves will be in phase and will produce constructive interference anytime their path length difference is a whole number of wavelengths. And when we have this constructive interference, we're going to hear that sound clearly. So that brings us to the question, what happens when the path length difference is not a whole number of wavelengths? For example, here our two speakers are separated by half a wavelength. In this case, the crests of one wave will align with the troughs of the other wave and be out of step with each other. We say that these two waves then are out of phase. When two waves are out of phase, they're equal and opposite at every point. The result of this is that the sum of the waves is zero at every point, and the superposition of the two waves produces a wave with zero amplitude. And what we get is called destructive interference. 
this destructive interference results from a path length difference of half a wavelength. So again, if we increase that path length difference by an additional wavelength, we would produce a picture that looks exactly the same as this. And so we'd have destructive interference for a path length difference of one and a half wavelengths and two and a half wavelengths and so on. That is, two waves will be out of phase and produce constructive interference anytime their path length difference is a whole number of wavelengths plus half a wavelength. So to sum this up, we'll always get a constructive interference whenever the path length difference is an integer multiple of the wavelength and we'll get destructive interference when the path length difference is an integer multiple plus half a wavelength. Showing us that the path length difference that's needed for constructive or destructive interference depends on the wavelength and therefore the frequency. If one particular frequency interferes destructively, another may not. The path length difference, though, is, is not necessarily the distance between the speakers. It's simply the difference in the distances traveled by the two waves. For example, these two speakers are 42 meters apart, and they face each other, and they emit identical 115 hertz waves. Uh, this woman, we'll call her Susan, is walking along a line between the speakers. As she walks, she finds herself moving through loud and quiet spots. So if she stands 19 and a half meters from one speaker, is she standing in a quiet spot or a loud spot? And we assume that the speed of sound here, of course, is 345 meters per second. So as Susan walks along uh, the line between the speakers, she moves between points of constructive interference where she gets loud spots and destructive inter interference where she gets quiet spots. So our question is, is her current position one of constructive or destructive interference? And this will depend on the path length difference. At her position, the distances the two waves travel to reach her are 19 and a half meters and 22 and a half meters which means at the point where she is, the two waves reach her and interfere. Their path length difference at that point is three meters. To know if we have constructive or destructive interference, then we need to compare uh, this path length difference with the wavelength using the wave equation. Taking the speed of sound to be 345 meters per second and our 115 hertz tone ends up being, the wavelength ends up being three meters. Because the path length difference is exactly one wavelength, Susan is standing at a point of constructive interference. That is, she's standing at a loud spot. Now, of course, this example assumes that the two loudspeakers are emitting identical waves. Let's assume we have a situation where uh, one loudspeaker emits a sound wave that's the exact inverse of the wave of the other speaker. So if those speakers are side by side so that the path length difference is zero, the superposition of those two waves will result in destructive interference. They'll completely cancel. The destructive interference does not require the waves to have any particular frequency or any particular shape. As long as the waves are exact inverses of each other, there will be destructive interference. This is how our headphones with noise canceling technology works. A microphone on the outside of the headphones measures the ambient sound. A circuit then inside the headphones produces an inverted version of the microphone signal and sends it to the headphone speakers. The real ambient sound and the inverted version of the ambient sound coming from the speakers arrive at the ears together and interfere destructively thus significantly reducing the sound intensity. In this case, adding sound results in a lower overall intensity inside the headphones. Now this interference along a line illustrates the idea, but it's not really realistic. In practice, sound waves uh, or light waves will spread out spherically. They're spherical waves. So here is a diagram of a spherical wave. And when we draw these, the wave fronts represent crests of the wave, and they're spaced by a wavelength. Halfway between two wave fronts, then, is the trough of the wave. So what happens, then, when two spherical waves overlap? 
both of these pictures here show that case. And what they show is that we end up with a pattern of constructive and destructive interference. Constructive interference occurs where two crests overlap, and destructive interference occurs where a crest overlaps a trough. The conditions for constructive and destructive interference are the same for spherical waves as they are for waves along a line. So the treatment that we have seen for sound waves can be applied to any wave. For any two wave sources, then, if we look at this uh, tactics box, uh, it sums up how to determine if the interference at a point is constructive or destructive. And of course, when we're looking at, at you know, specific points, we can line those points up to get what we call antinodal lines and nodal lines. Antinodal lines are, are lines where any point along that line you're going to get uh, constructive interference. The intensity then is at its maximum value along those lines. And nodal lines then are destructive interference and the, the intensity then would be zero at any point along those lines. Now, so far, we've looked at the superposition of waves from sources having the same wavelength and frequency. We can also use the principle of superposition to look at a phenomenon that's easily demonstrated with two sources of slightly different frequency and wavelength. So suppose two waves are traveling towards your ear, and the two waves have the same amplitude but slightly different frequencies. In this picture here, the red wave has a slightly higher frequency than the orange wave. This slight difference causes the waves to combine in a manner that alternates between constructive and destructive interference. Their superposition, drawn here in blue below, is a wave whose amplitude shows a periodic variation. As the waves reach your ear, you're, you'll hear a single tone whose intensity then is modulated. That is, the sound goes up and down in volume, loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft, making a distinctive pattern that we call beats. As an example of beats, then, here are uh, two tones, one 500 hertz, one 501 hertz, played at the same time. If I increase the frequency of one of them to say 503 hertz, the beat sounds like this. So when you hear those, it, by the time that the sound reaches your ears, these waves are, undergo interference. They physically add together, and this superposition results in a wave that reaches your ear of one half of times F1 plus F2. This is the average of the two frequencies and it, it differs little from either since the two frequencies are nearly equal. The intensity of this sound then is modulated at a frequency that we call the beat frequency. The beat frequency is simply the difference between the two individual frequencies. When you go to tune instruments, we, we use beats, right? Uh, for example, a flute, right? One that's properly tuned at 440 hertz, but say you got another flute that plays at 438 hertz. The flutist will hear two loud, soft, loud beats per second. The second flutist is flat then and needs to shorten their flute very slightly to bring the frequency up to 440 hertz. We can also use beats in, in other uh, uses as well. For example, take uh, the little brown bat. It's a common bat species in North America. It lives uh, around our area quite a lot. It emits echolocation pulses at a frequency of 40 kilohertz, which is well above the range of human hearing. To, so uh, to allow observers to hear these bats, the, uh, we need a bat detector, as was shown in this picture here, uh, to combine the bat's sound wave at, at some frequency. Uh, we'll call it frequency F1 with a wave of frequency F2 from a tunable oscillator. The resulting beat frequency is isolated with a filter and then amplified and sent to a loudspeaker. Now, to what frequency should this tunable oscillator be set to produce an audible beat frequency of, say, 3 kilohertz? 
So the beat frequency is the absolute value of the difference between the two frequencies. So this oscillator frequency and the bat frequency need to be different by three kilohertz. So in this example, we'd have to set that oscillator at either 37 kilohertz or at 43 kilohertz. Either one would work nicely and allow you to hear Mr. Bat. Okay, so that'll do it for this video. Make sure you go through and summarize this information in a way that will help you to remember it and see you in class.